the state of our union is good. We're making incredible progress, right? And um, in terms of um, awareness, uh, it's reaching and increasing to patients, providers, uh, diagnostics, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I think you'll hear some of the other speakers talking about the multiple sleep latency test, that awful napping test that we uh, rely upon so heavily. Uh, may be on its way out, but the major challenge is what's going to replace it um, if it's moving that way. Um, there's new insights into the causes of hypersomnia and hypersomnolence. Um, we have some increasingly available symptomatic rem remedies. They certainly are not cures at this point. And um, you'll see information I'll present that um, there's a lot of diverse communities and stakeholders in terms of resources that are sort of being devoted to what this is, which is a huge unmet clinical need. And I think we should all feel really good about that. So um, in terms of the attention, um, back in 2016, people probably remember in Denver, there was a platform presentation uh, that Dr. Trotty chaired uh, that brought a lot of what was exciting at that time and starting to swell into some uh, diagnostic, scientific, and treatment challenges of hypersomnolence. And then recently in Prague at the World Sleep Meeting last year, one of our medical advisory board members, Isabel Arnolf, chaired a session on idiopathic hypersomnia, a neglected disorder. Two years before that in Valencia at the World Sleep Meeting, my wife and I attended and there was maybe 60 people in the room. Uh, and I think the Powells were here at this one and it was standing room only. Uh, and it's, I think, certainly being recognized and appreciated by a lot of people around the world as sort of one of the last great hurdles in terms of our understanding in sleep medicine. These are some quotes from the World Sleep Meeting. Um, I uh, wrote down in my little diary as I was uh, attending different sessions and uh, I think uh, sort of um, are very important in terms of how we're changing or the, ch the ship is changing in terms of uh, where it's headed uh, as a field diagnostically. Uh, Dr. Mignot, Emmanuel Mignot, who most people know in terms of his discovery of hypocretin related to narcolepsy, uh, said the MSLT, multiple sleep latency test, has led us astray. Um, Isabel Arnold, the MSLT is not the way to capture the phenotype of these patients. Uh, the concept of narcolepsy type 2 becoming more and more meaningless from Dr. Mignot. These are quotes, I didn't make these up. Um, they're too good for that. Um, Marku Partman from Finland, who's actually, I think, the PI on the Umicrim trial. We heard about Umicrim, we'll talk about. He says that he believes idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2 may be the same disease. And finally, Nevisomlava, um, who is a student with Bedrick Roth, uh, who first coined the term idiopathic hypersomnia. I think it made an insightful comment, which I think several, many of us are starting to agree with, is that idiopathic hypersomnia, particularly the type with long sleep, is a clinical entity with a strong genetic predisposition. So that's very important. Here is a uh, summary slide over years. In orange, uh, in five-year increments, I went into PubMed to see how many papers were published, manuscripts that were published per five-year period. Now on the left side, the access is number of publications for Klein-Levin in blue and idiopathic hypersomnia in orange. You can see in the 80s, we were talking about three, four papers per five-year period. I mean, dismal, right? And look where we're at now. Uh, as of 2015 and to 2018, we still have another year and a half of this year and next year for the five-year block, and we're well over 100. Um, the scale for narcolepsy is in yellow, but it's represented on the right side. It has a similar trajectory, at least until quite recently, and, but the, it's a tenfold difference or increase in tenfold 
different number of articles. So a lot more attention on the keyword narcolepsy, but A, the trajectory of IH is in different now and certainly much greater than it's been. This is um, a poster that's being presented from uh, Jazz at this meeting looking at insurance claims data and it's sort of looking over 2013 to 2016, narcolepsy being on the top and um, in blue and the increase is getting a little flatter on the bottom just because of the scale is idiopathic hypersomnia. And they may look very similar, but that increase in narcolepsy is only about 13%, whereas the increase in idiopathic hypersomnia and in insurance claims data is about 33% increase. So certainly it's showing up uh, in that domain as well. There are registries, we'll hear about one, uh, the CORDS registry that I think a lot of people have participated in. Uh, but there are, to let you know, other sources of biological material and information related to patients that is increasingly being collected and it certainly, uh, in terms of how it might be accessed to um, further inform us. The European Narcolepsy Network, uh, 37 centers, you can see here, that was updated in a publication in 015 mostly narcolepsy patients, uh, a few IH patients in that registry. The Narco Bank in France, this is from a slide from Isabel Arnolf, uh, three centers in France. You can see a healthy number, about 221 idiopathic hypersomnia patients, and they do have spinal fluid and DNA. Our center by itself uh, is greater than either of those two. Um, and increasingly we're collecting um, spinal fluids as well as whole blood and DNA, as many of you know. And then the CORDS uh, registry, we'll hear more about at this meeting, which is very exciting and something the foundation, along with CORDS, was really key on developing and uh, initiating, kicking off two years ago. This is even better news. The individual years on the bottom from the 80s and this is looking at the number of active grants funded by the National Institute of Health per year um, that have keyword hypersomnia in the abstract or as part of the uh, research protocol. And you can see right after 08, when things were at eight, nine publications, uh, there was a drop off. That was the, the economic crisis and that hit all of science but you can see the rebound recovery after going down to two, two, and three. We are now at the highest level yet, not 12 grants funded by the NIH with keyword hypersomnia in it. So again, we're headed in the right direction. These are all good things. The more people involved, the better. Here's an example, the ones that we're aware of, or I'm personally aware of that are directly relevant to this population. Uh, David Plant, who's on our medical advisory boards, a psychiatry sleep specialist, just finishing his K-23. A K-23 is essentially a transitional career development pathway to become independent. Uh, researcher, Dr. Trotty, uh, who you'll hear from later at Emory, also a K-23, doing neuroimaging, uh, myself at Emory. Uh, Dr. Chung at Stanford just received, if you see the date here, September of 17, uh, is going to be working uh, in his mentor, Dr. Mignot, and they'll be doing genetics of idiopathic hypersomnia as part of his K-23. And uh, Nick Bonin actually, interestingly, got a grant funded primarily referencing some of the work I'll talk about here today, but applying it to Parkinson's disease. Patients with Parkinson's disease are also very sleepy, can sleep long periods of time, and using some of our information regarding flumazenil and clarithromycin has actually got a grant just funded, a full R01 to look at brain imaging in these patients to see how flumazenil binding may actually uh, associate or predict improvements in alertness when treated with flumazenil. So that'll be very interesting to see as well. Uh, again, as mentioned by Diane, uh, in, increased industry 
um, involvement and recognition. And just to start the story of looking big picture, uh, I always love the apples and oranges analogy or metaphor or allegory. Um, whereas narcolepsy and hypersomnia are both fruits, they're different. Um, narcolepsy is a tax of sleep, whereas hypersomnia is prolonged sleep and sort of perpetual sleepiness, that this sort of this brain fog that hangs over. And so um, that's an important, very important distinction that many of you probably suffer from this and what we see in clinic is this sort of second nature. But to the rest of the world, the rest of the physicians, this is not really clearly appreciated or greatly appreciated. So this may seem simple, but I think it's critically important. So that dichotomy I is critical. And we'll come back to the usefulness of this uh, allegory in a minute. But uh, um, in fact, let's go back. I thought I had a pointer. Um, the person, so Bedrick Roth, it was really attributed with the, using the term idiopathic hypersomnia, but other physicians and um, uh, before that uh, probably also, or I shouldn't say probably, but definitely made um, distinctions between the same distinction. Gowers, who preceded Bedrick Roth by 50, 60, 70 years, he was a Victorian neurologist. He used the word somnosis to d make a distinction between hypersomnia and narcolepsy, which he viewed as different. So a very important concept. But going forward, here's our problem, or one of our challenges, is lots of people can have hypersomnia. They can be those apples. But all these apples are not the same. Do they, you know, w and we have to pick out which one is quote unquote idiopathic hypersomnia. There could be hypersomnia due to low thyroid. There could be hypersomnia due to anemia, um, other causes. Uh, we'll talk about some later in this talk, but our challenge or the challenge to clinicians is which apple, which one's idiopathic hypersomnia, which one's the Granny Smith, as opposed to, you know, just uh, something else. So, pointing out that indeed in the population, lots of people report sleeping a lot. Um, if you look at this data from a population-based survey, survey um, 1.6 of the percent of the population reports sleeping more than nine hours and experiencing a de deteriorated quality of wakefulness. And not that uh, it's MSLT based or sleepiness based, but if you use the Diagnostic Statistics Manual 4, DSM 4, which is a psychiatric based manual, about half percent meet the criteria of hypersomnia or hypersomnolence disorder, which seems the closest to quote unquote idiopathic hypersomnia in this sleep field. So that's a lot of people, one in 200. Possibly, even though it's sort of discussed as a rare disorder, that may be one in 10,000. So we're the field is still trying to grapple with this. Everyone is. Um, payers, insurance, um, physicians, clinicians, and patients. So the International Classification of Sleep Disorders recognizes in the central disorders of hypersomnolence all these different disorders, narcolepsy type one and two, Klein-Levin syndrome, idiopathic hypersomnia, and then other hypersomnias related to medical or psychi psychiatric conditions. And the new definitions in the International Classification of Sleep Disorders version three um, essentially give you three doorways to a diagnosis. One, you essentially have a multiple sleep latency test that demonstrates a latency to sleep of less than eight minutes. Um, and no dreaming, or excuse me, dreaming and only one of those is allowed. You could also sleep more than 11 hours in a 24 hour period if you were allowed to do that in a sleep lab, but nobody does that in any standard way. So, is that really a useful doorway? And then the third is doing actigraphy, sort of a Fitbit-based measurement or surrogate that movement is awake and lack of movement is assumed to be sleep. Well, is that really a 
really good assumption. And that would be an average of 11 hours per 24 hours. So these are three different doorways into the diagnosis. It's not clear, are those the same? In other words, if I took a person with quote unquote idiopathic hypersomnia and did each three of those, would they all get to the same person with the same biology and predict the same treatment? So just because we have a name <laughs> makes us, you know, gives us identity, but in terms of its specificity, is very difficult, and I think that's a huge frustration, not only for patients, but from a big picture, from a pharmaceutical company or developing treatments, huge problem, right? Because how are you gonna select patients that are kind of somewhat homogeneous? Are all three doorways leading to the same group of people? We really don't know that. So a lot of times these rules and things are, are developed and they, they iterate over time as we learn things, but this is what we're left with in terms of application on the ground level. Very frustrating. But the MSLT, I think you'll hear from other folks, is on its way to the, to the, the nail in the coffin here. The, the problem, as I mentioned, or the challenge again, is what's gonna replace this? You know, what are we gonna use to sort of measure the problems patients experience and to accurately identify, hopefully with some insight into the biology and treatment. What's the tool? Here's some of the papers. Um, so as it being the MSLT being a diagnostic gold standard anymore, I think the ship is out. It's pretty much in the field viewed as no. Uh, and it's largely be because if you repeat the test, twice on the same person, the diagnosis changes about half the time. So one day you're idiopathic hypersomnia, next month you're narcolepsy type two, two months later you're normal. So is that just a fluctuation in the disease process, whatever it is we're trying to capture, or is that just this is a bad test and not what we should be doing? So this is something as a field we, we're struggling with. And you can see here the original article by Dr. Trotty and myself and one of our residents or fellows was in 2013 and now it's pylon, right? So you're gonna see a lot more of these papers saying yes, we agree with that. But the first one was the toughest one to get, <laughs> to, to get published. Um, so we need alternate strategies, okay? So not only is it not very specific, for at least idiopathic hypersomnia, it's also not very sensitive. So a lot of patients, as Isabel Arnolf has shown, basically test normal. And then you're like, you know, patients in the family are like, there's something not right with, with my son, my daughter, my loved one, and it, you know, they're just distraught that they can't be captured. Um, and also population normative data for the multiple sleep latency test. How many people do you think fall asleep faster than eight minutes if I just grab them off the street and put them on this test? Like 22%. Do they all have idiopathic hypersomnia or are they just living in a world where they're partly sleep restricted, they're taking a medicine, there's other reasons to be sleepy? And that sort of, we have to sort of also be aware of sort of overuse of the term <laughs> and misappropriate use if we're using this test. So it's a double-edged sword. You know, we need something, but you know, if we do these tests like in the MSLT, it's, it's gonna be problematic. We don't wanna, you know, be the, you know, Peter and the wolf, uh, so to speak. Um, and the multiple sleep latency test is time and labor intensive, costs a lot of money. Uh, and also the differences between laboratories and how the test is conducted are different. Those of you who've had it done at Emory, you'll know sometimes we'll let people just sleep ad lib and then maybe nap them a couple times in the afternoon. And otherwise, other laboratories are like, uh-uh, tech's gotta go home at 6.30 in the morning, wake the patient up. They are more concerned about, you know, the practicalities of running the laboratory as a business rather than actually assessing the patient's complaints. So 
those are gonna be big things to change, like I said, is uh, you know, that we're field is convincing itself that the data obtained with the traditional MSLT is not very good for much, but changing that is going to be is going to be difficult as well, more from an on the ground practical standpoint. So this is going to happen probably in a few centers, probably need a working group at a few academic centers. Again, from that abstract that uh, jazz folks did from claims data, you can see some of that trend here. Uh, that, that, that sort of says is also going to be a challenge. So they're looking at the rate of in-laboratory sleep studies in 2013 per 100,000 people and the rate in 2016. So getting into a sleep lab is more difficult, down by 14 percent, okay? And getting a multiple sleep latency test is down 22 percent, just over a three to four year period. Home sleep testing, mostly designated for sleep apnea, is up 118%. So as we're having this discussion about how we have to come up with new tools, the, in the background, we have to worry about what's going on from a payer standpoint and insurance in terms of if we're going to develop technologies to help patients identify them and treat them and look at treatment response, we have to keep track of these bigger trends also. And so in thinking about that, here's what's happening uh, from many people in the field, some of whom are on our boards, uh, and some presented here at this meeting. Uh, what are their ways? So subjectively, there's new scales that are being developed, new questionnaires and scales, and then other objective testing that's not so burdensome and not so costly and, and uh, maybe easier to use and do repeated testing. So extended sleep is more difficult, ad lib sleep certainly, but ambulatory EEG, uh, wearables we talked about, looking at specific signatures of EEG brain waves, psychomotor vigilance, critical flicker fusion, you can see all these here, and then biomarkers I think is really gonna be critical, either from spinal fluids or uh, uh, even plasma or serum. And examples of that relevant here, uh, just summarize briefly, uh, Dr. Plant has a poster at the APSS meeting upcoming. Uh, we also, our group, looking at psychomotor vigilance and also trying to get to these memory complaints that folks talk about a lot, more kind of working memory issues. And um, also Dr. Mignot's group, uh, working on some statistical machine learning of EEG. Dr. Trotty's going to talk more about treatment in her uh, summary, so I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail, although to point out that this paper from our French colleagues uh, early in this year essentially uh, summarizes uh, the state of the field, uh, it particularly I think with the European bent, but really only sort of sp speaks about modafinil in terms of any uh, studies of good clinical practice, but we'll hear from Dr. Trotty more about it. Now, many treatments work, and we'll hear about that uh, for different types of patients, but it's like the doorway, trying to figure out which patient matches to which phenotype and which medication and biology is res relevant to each patient type. This is to give you an idea if we just say anybody who falls asleep and meets these criteria of IH at the top, what drops down? About a third of those patients will not respond to modafinil or traditional treatments, at least. Maybe a little more. It depends on what the outcome is. And then when you fall through that, about half of those are responsive to agents that we've recently discussed quite a bit, which are these agents that antagonize the GABA receptor, gamma aminobutyric acid receptor, so either flumazenil or clarithromycin. Uh, this is a reminder, we'll hear more about this uh, at this conference from Dr. Jenkins, the GABA receptor. Um, sort of a little cartoon of it sitting in a cell membrane. And to point out that um, where the benzodiazepine binds there between the red alpha and the gamma subunits, this discovery in spinal fluid that there may be a peptide that 
called what's called an endazepine. It's an endogenous benzodiazepine-like substance that binds nearby, uh, that increases the functionality or sensitivity of the receptor to GABA. Also notice in the lower right-hand corner, this receptor near the membrane has binding sites for other agents that make us sleepy. Barbiturates, alcohol, most importantly, neurosteroids, and that's going to be an increasing uh, interest uh, as we go through uh, the rest of this um, meeting. Uh, this was our original paper in 2012. And uh, sort of Dr. Trotty, as I mentioned, will discuss this in more detail about the use of uh, flumazenil and other receptor agents. Our own personal experience uh, through pavilion compounding pharmacy in response, a little letter uh, to the uh, response to a paper that we wrote last year, we looked at our own personal experience because this is one of the few other than Village Pharmacy that provides flumazenil and two other highly prescribing physicians in the Southeast. Um, and between the four of us, we had given flumazenil or prescribed it to 344 individual subjects at that time. And 18, and this is rolling, because we only started doing it in 2013. So some of these numbers um, may be an underestimate rather than an overestimate. 18 subjects have been taking it for at least two years continuously. So there's definitely a subgroup of people that respond to this drug. Otherwise, why spend money out of pocket? Because this is not usually covered very well by insurance companies. What we also found out recently was there were, um, at that time, 89 other physicians in the US prescribing it, uh, which is not easy to do from a compounding pharmacy from a distance. but. Just recently, when talking to Brad Cheerson at Pavilion, there's now over 200 prescribing physicians, and of, or 100, and of those, 28 had prescribed it to five patients each. So it's sort of speaking to some momentum, at least, that A, we're out there, people are getting the message, they're using this agent, it's working on a group of people. I think, again, the challenge is who is that group of people and how do you target them and identify them um, and understand more about their biology? Because this is pretty impressive. So the agents, and Dr. Trotty again will speak about it in more detail, but what really led to um, uh, was some open label work with five subjects looking at the balanced drug, BTD001, that was studied in the first ARISE trial and you can see here across the x-axis is current medication, and on the y-axis is the Epworth score. And these five patients were being treated either with flumazenil or clarithromycin, as well as a, a wake-promoting agent. Could have been an amphetamine, could have been modafinil on the, on the first measurement. So their Epworth scales were uh, in treatment mode. Uh, you can see a couple of them were below 10. So probably doing quite well. They were then asked to wash out off medicine, and you can see their Epworth scales went up. This is just subjective report. And then they received a dose of, um, for a week of balanced drug at twice a day. Epworth got a little better, and then they got the higher dose. You can notice this one individual in orange basically went to no sleepiness. Um, on the second measurement or second week when he was taking the higher dose of this drug. And then uh, on the washout, they then went off drug and were on no drug to see if their sleepiness returned. And you can see in m most cases, uh, well, all cases it did. But interestingly, in, in one of them, that one specifically, it didn't go back to baseline. So there may be some carryover effect that's, that may be relevant in some of these folks. So this was presented at the World Sleep Meeting as an abstract last year, and that leads to what's coming. So what's coming is a rise too, which will be, I think, enrolling from my knowledge in a few weeks. Um, to 35 centers, they're gonna enroll 80 subjects, uh, double-blind crossover, um, so within subjects, 
two different assessment or two different uh, treatment modes, and then outcomes will be the Epworth maintenance of wakefulness, and interestingly enough, some measurement of mental fog. Um, getting to what I think we hear from a lot of patients, a lot this brain fog, and I think that message has come through even in sort of prepping for this study and to the FDA. Now, the other challenge we've had, and I know that a lot of the social networks talk about this, and we see it in clinic too, is this issue of, well, idiopathic hypersomnia, does it occur alone or does it occur with things, other things, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, POTS, you know, all these, and, and those are all interesting if you can see associations that are strong but very difficult to do for selection bias purposes in a clinic. The other approach is to sort of say, is there any other disorder that phenocopies, that looks a lot like idiopathic hypersomnia as we understand it to be, that we understand more about because it has a defined biology? And can we use a studying that disorder as sort of giving us some insights or complements? So that's sort of getting to this, uh, taking the apple allegory. Let's try to find another apple that looks really much like the Granny Smith, maybe not green, but very much the same in size and taste and everything else, and is genetically determined. Interestingly, there's an old syndrome list in the uh, 19th century said we must analyze and seek to interpret partnerships in disease. And I think that's a really important concept in terms of helping us understand and inform us of other. So that brings us why. Why is that important? It gives us a tremendous leverage because we bring in another group of people and expertise that are studying another disorder that may have a, mu a much better understood biological basis that can help us and complement us for understanding it. And that's been the case with this disorder. Uh, to explain why we're so interested uh, is myotonic dystrophy, <clears throat> a genetic disorder. Um, in this description in the 1960s, you have to put this in the context of what wasn't known. Nobody did polysomnography in the 1960s. Nobody had an MSLT in the 1960s. This is just good old clinical sit by the bedside, describe what you hear and see. Neurologist again, um, and in England, four patients with myotonic dystrophy, and I think you'll relate to this. They made the big point though, like Bedrick Roth and like Gowers before. They have hypersomnia that co-occurs with sleepiness. I can see everybody when they come to clinic if they're yawning or their eyes, lids are drooping. That's somnolence. That's what the MSLT measures. But when you're sitting in front of a physician in a clinic and you're wide awake and it's a good part of your day, maybe just by chance, and you're telling them I have a problem, and they're like, <laughs> they can't measure hypersomnia other than believing you, right? But here you go. Hypersomnia on top of, and hypersomnia is the more prominent feature in these patients. Love it. An unmanageable liability to oversleep. <laughs> Sound familiar? Uh, patients need to be shaken awake in the morning physically. Rarely in bed after 8 o'clock at night. Um, but also this issue that they noticed, yeah, there was some fluctuation too, right? I kind of made that point before. Why does the test change and why do symptoms change? But also it didn't relate to the muscle disease. And in fact, in one of the patients that they reported, the sleepiness predated the muscle disease or recognition of the muscle disease. And that's actually how we found out about this. One of the patients in our original 2012 patient, our paper, we found had myotonic dystrophy after that paper was published. So he had responded beautifully to flumazin and we were like, oh my gosh, she's got myotonic dystrophy. So that was our first hint. And then you start doing some reading and you find out, again, these guys, these neurologists, this isn't narcolepsy. 
all right? This is even before they had an MSLP. So here's an example of one case um, of uh, looking at this. And the point I want to make, uh, this young lady has myotonic dystrophy. She's had bad sleepiness, preventing her from going to medical school. And you can see the upward sleepiness scale, um, which is above 10, so sleepy. On flamazinol, she goes down to five. Clinically meaningful is about three to four point improvement. So that's a big improvement. That's a traditional measure. Functional outcomes of sleep is also fairly traditional. Five to 20 point scale, she was at a 10. She went to 19. So you know what CPAP does if you have apnea? You get better by three points. She's better by almost 10 points on that scale. Very dramatic. This was last spring, but this year she's still sitting here a year later with that sort of response. Now, what's interesting is below it. These are non-traditional measures I sort of introduced before. The, the NIH is now very interested in fatigue as an outcome measure. And you can see here dramatic improvements in the construct of, in the domains of different types of fatigue, both mental fatigue and physical fatigue. So it's grabbing another component, right, of whatever the patient's complaint is, not just about sleepiness and sleep inertia, not being able to get up. That's one, here's another. This patient just recently we started and he got tried on our modafinil, which the brand name is New Vigil. And you can see the New Vigil put a little dent, helped a little bit, but didn't like it. His girlfriend told him it made him edgy, maybe a little sped up. So we took him off, put him on flamazinol, and you can see fairly, very similar to the young lady same age too, young 20s, just starting college, but dramatic improvements in, in uh, many other domains beyond sleepiness. So another hopeful sign. So why is it in myotonic dystrophy? So the insights are coming from colleagues and collaborators, Dr. Gary Bissell, who's here, who's chairman of biology at Emory, Eric Wang, who'll be getting here tomorrow from the University of Florida, and others. But we've looked at the spinal fluid in four patients, Dr. Jenkins has, he'll be speaking today and tomorrow, and those four patients have this endozepine somnogen-like substance. But what's also interesting in, in autopsy materials and animal models of myotonic dystrophy is that the GABA receptor itself is genetically altered, and it's altered to be a more sensitive receptor. So not only are the patients probably have a substance floating around that's activating the receptor, the receptor itself is more sensitive. So it should be expected. There's a long literature of patients with myotonic dystrophy being sensitive to benzodiazepines and not waking up, quote unquote, after surgeries. They're very sensitive to anesthetics. Um, so this sort of fits the theme and seems to be a really interesting complementary line of research to study with respect to um, hypersomnia. Now, just to finish up, then we have these different disorders, idiopathic hypersomnia, maybe some patients with narcolepsy type 2, in many of them, or 30 percent maybe, endozepine-like substance, about half of those seem to respond. That has led to this trial uh, from Balanced Therapeutics called ARISE-1 and now ARISE-2 and also from Umicrin. Umicrin has a molecule GR3027, which is in clinical trial in Finland and Denmark for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, for myotonic dystrophy, the offending agent or biology, the endozepine substance, but also a GABA receptor that might be more sensitive. Uh, right now we're just doing sort of open label assessments with flumazino and also um, animal models in the lab. Finally, uh, another disorder, I won't go into much detail, but one way, doorway that um, Umicrin came to this was the um, disorder of hepatic encephalopathy. People that end up with chronic liver disease get very sleepy and, and, and can't stay awake and have a lot of brain fog and also their molecule um, is being developed there, but it's targeting neurosteroids. Um, 
These are the clinical trials where they're at. Uh, Balance will be recruiting, I am told, soon. They had their investigators meeting last night before this meeting here. Uh, Umicrin is ongoing. And Jazz uh, Pharmaceuticals just announced, uh, I think on clinicaltrials.gov, that they will be starting a trial in September uh, to assess their JZP258, which is an analog or similar to gamma hydroxybutyrate, also known as Xyrem. It's a lower salt content version. So other quote unquote registered trials, um, not really anything medicinal per se. There is one study at Ohio State looking at transcranial um, stimulation. Um, the others are actually both in Europe, one in France, one in Switzerland, which are recruiting patients to look at aspects of the biology, but not really a treatment per se, but assessing patients to try to understand what the biology is. So where else? We're still sort of in search of what this molecule's mystery somnogen is. We'll talk about that in a second, briefly. Also, Dr. Jenkins will tell you at this meeting about some of the molecular sites on the receptor, where we're acting, uh, what re brain regions we'll hear. There's been advances in imaging, um, not structural per se, but just functional imaging about what parts of the brain may be involved in this that might give us clues. Uh, also, genetics. And uh, most importantly, who is the target population? We, do, we seem to have some treatments for a, su a subgroup of people uh, with idiopathic, one of the apples in the 12 apples. Um, but how do we find them? And this is just showing you from a, uh, what's called a volcano plot. Don't be too uh, daunted by this. Uh, I'll try to walk you through it. On the x-axis, uh, each dot represents a peptide. And right in the middle of this, at zero, there's the right, to the right side are a bunch of dots, to the right side, and up, going up is significant. So the higher up is more significant, and, and then the intensities are on the X, and it's sort of saying what peptides are in spinal fluid of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia that respond to flumazenil. So in our clinic, compared to patients who have no complaints of sleepiness. So all the dots on the right side to the right of zero, going up more and more significant, are peptides that are more prevalent in patients than controls. On the other side of zero to the left side are the number of peptides that are underrepresented in patients versus controls. The main issue is there's a lot more going on in the spinal fluids in terms of excess numbers of peptides in patients than in controls, as opposed to underrepresented, okay? So there's a lot of potential targets in biology to go after, maybe too much, right? <laughs> daunting. But this is only peptides smaller than 10,000 molecular weight. So this is not all the peptides in your spinal fluid because we know the peptide that we're interested in is smaller. So anyways, this you know, sort of almost, to me, substantiates the gain of function idea. There's more going on in these people than in control in spinal fluid. Hopefully that was helpful. And then finally, the genetic approaches. We're already starting to collaborate with folks, again, using the apple allegory, which I like. Your population patients on the left, and your subjects on the, uh, on the right, you're gonna occasionally grab a real patient if you go into the population unknowingly. You just hope to get a nice basket over here of well-defined patients so we can differentiate what's unique to their genetics versus just the general population. So, we've come a long way. <laughs> and I spoke much too long. Um, there, um, we have a subgroup of patients that don't respond well, that's why, you know, to wake-promoting drugs traditionally, and that's what's got us started and pointed in direction here. Um, and it also seems to be relevant maybe to hypersomnia that occurs in other diseases. 
like myotonic dystrophy and maybe hepatic encephalopathy. Um, we have a growing number of new partners. We have clinician scientists. We've garnered input from other basic science researchers, some of whom are here, um, who would never otherwise be. Industry, where we did not have three, four years ago. Um, and disease foundations, not only our own, but other ones that uh, Diane mentioned. Ongoing and anticipated clinical trials where we had none, <laughs> um, so that's helpful. And we have a passionate, engaged foundation and a community, you, that's made a lot of this happen. It wouldn't be possible um, without you and sort of other stakeholders, and uh, thank you for that. One last parting thing, uh, Andrew Powell, Diane's husband, over here somewhere, had once told me, and I can't get it out of my head, is this idea is, at the end of the day, the challenge to us is trying to figure out what the package answer says when we have the treatment. <laughs> sort of, we can't just say, this is a drug to make you feel better, <laughs> right? So that's a huge challenge, and it sort of gets back to, you know, we're in the home of, actually, Victor McCusick was at Hopkins, was the father of human genetics, clinical genetics, and the father of what was called OMEN. And this is from a paper that he wrote. And I think these are really just important to keep in mind. Once recognized, a disease entity presents problems in naming, and names are important, just like they are for the distinction between narcolepsy and whatever this is. Whatever type of hypersomnia, there may be three forms, five forms, two forms, don't know. A syndrome has arrived if it has a name. <laughs> How true, right? Um, but differences in phenotype are some of the most treacherous bases for decisions. In other words, the MSLT to make a decision, for example, is treacherous to do for IH, for example. Um, so these were written back in the 60s, so, so true still today, it's important to keep in mind. This would not be possible, I could not be standing here without a tremendous amount of support from a heck of a lot of people. Um, patient contribu contributions kept us going when uh, NIH wasn't there for us, they are now, but uh, the Woodruff Health Sciences Fund, it's in Emory, uh, Dr. Trotty got a fund to study uh, Clorithromycin use from American Sleep Medicine Foundation, which is sort of in part of the meeting here, the general APSS meeting. NIH grants that I had mentioned, the Mind Science Foundation, and our new partner is the Marigold Foundation, and that's the myotonic dystrophy work, so bringing in other resources. And lots and lots of people, different universities, a lot of people at Emory and different departments, the, the, the real importance of team science. We're not, none of us can really do this much anymore by our, ourselves. Uh, the, the amount of effort and coordination and expertise. Uh, and here are some of those folks, pictures. Dr. Trotty asleep on a lava field in Iceland. Many of you know Prabjot there in the middle. I've met him if you've come to Emory, but um, Dr. Don Blywise, uh, Gary Bissell over on the far left, he's here at the meeting, Andy Jenkins in the middle on the top, um, and then a lot of other folks that have helped. My parents in the upper uh, left have been big supporters, helped keep the boat afloat when it was just starting out years ago and are continually continuing to support and uh, family and also these ladies over here on the board and a couple new grandbabies in our house. So it's all been fun and interesting few months. All right, I'm moving back to the center. Thank you. And does anyone have a question? Oh, you have a question, right, great, good. Hi, Dr. I. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I liked that, uh, I thought it was interesting, that slide uh, with the proteon uh, proteonomics, proteomics, proteomics um, about IH patients who respond to flumazenil, but you said that 50% don't respond to flumazenil. Have you, have you done the correlation? Do you see yeah. 
anything so in that, those who don't, but have yeah. IH so as the opposed answer, to. The short answer is no, but that's going to have to be done, right? That'll substantiate that even more, right? And maybe identify something unique to the non-responders. The other group that now we're getting uh, also as part of that grant is, um, is folks who fluctuate dramatically. So within subjects comparisons are probably even cleaner and stronger, so we're also focusing some on that. So patients who, when they're asymptomatic or relatively asymptomatic versus when they're really, really sleepy, that can either be related to menstrual cycle or kind of a Klein-Levin-like thing. We've got to be careful using that term. And, but yeah, I th Thank we're going to do what you said, yeah, for sure. You had mentioned that uh, there are, you know, sort of some things that seem to be go along uh, with the hypersomnia that, you know, you wonder whether there's patterns with things. Yeah. I was just thinking, considering, I'm, and I was at the first conference and there was the comment that was raised about uh, some people saying that they got worse after having surgery and they, you know, ask and raised hands and I know we're talking about that on Sunday. I was just thinking if there were other things that you had noticed that there was a question of how many people with hypersomnia have yep. that you've got a group here. Could we ask if yeah, about yeah. that and get a sense for the rest of us? It's going to be a great segue to Dr. Trotty telling you why we need a registry of 10,000 people instead of 1,000, right? Those, those are the sort of really good questions to sort of probe there. I think that in, in these clinics that we have, or at least I have, it's tough to do, right? Because you're, you have a very select group of people that have smart enough or wealthy enough or whatever, or have a physician that knows enough to refer them or they can negotiate the system and they come. So what I, what I see in clinic is a very biased sample. I mean, and that's, that's the first thing I'm more than willing to admit all, always. And then you sort of say, if that's the case, then how do you address sort of bigger populations and how do you make this relevant? And that's why the registry is so damn important and why Whoever's come and see me, if you haven't gotten handed to me a, a brochure from the IH with a little business card with cords stapled to it, please let me know, because I think I've handed them to everybody I've seen and made more than emphasize the need to do this. 